Imagine a ship, a floating city, 963 feet long, slicing through the ocean at nearly 37 miles per hour. That was a legendary QE2. But how do they propel such a colossal ship at those incredible speeds? Let's ditch the deck chairs and dive deep into the heart of the ship, the QE2's engine room. And this isn't your average engine room. Over her 40-year reign, the QE2 underwent a radical transformation. First, she ploughed through the ocean with steam turbines, and then in a groundbreaking refit, she was reborn with a cutting-edge diesel-electric system. And it's this system, the one that made the QE2 faster than today's Queen Mary 2, that we're exploring in this video. I'm Chris Frame, the Maritime Historian, and your guide on this exclusive behind-the-scenes tour. When the QE2 was re-engined in the 1980s, Cunard replaced a steam turbine system with an entirely new, modern, diesel-electric power plant, which is still the kind of engines that are used in most of today's cruise ships. Picture this, over 4,700 tonnes of scrap metal, the ghosts of the old steam turbine engines ripped out to make way for the future. New engines, new motors, new propellers, and a complete revolution. This wasn't just an upgrade, it was a total rebirth of the QE2. In a diesel-electric ship, power is generated by the diesel engines. In the QE2's case, these were nine medium-speed diesel-electric engines. Each nine-cylinder turbocharged engine was about the size of a London double-decker bus, and as I said before, the QE2 had nine of them. The QE2's engines were housed in two massive engine rooms, with four in the forward room and five in the aft. As the QE2's engine room had been designed for big, round steam turbine engines, the space allowed for an amazing view over the top of the power plant, which is really quite rare and not something seen on modern day cruise ships. Now forget everything you know about traditional engines, these were not direct drive. The QE2's diesel electric power plant generated electricity, pure, raw power. Each engine room cranked out 10.5 megawatts, and if you do the maths, that's 94.5 megawatts, enough to power a city the size of Southampton back in 1987. But where did all this power go? Nine megawatts fed the hotel services through massive liquid-cooled transformers. Electricity flowed to every light, every elevator, every kitchen, every cabin, everything that made life on QE2 possible. When the QE2 was docked, just one of the nine engines could supply the nine megawatts of hotel service power that was required. In reality, they'd keep more than one fired up for redundancy. Most of the QE2's power was used to drive the ship, thanks to two giant propulsion motors. Built by GEC England, each propulsion motor was about the size of two London double-decker buses and weighed around 400 tonnes. They were rated at 44 megawatts, making them the most powerful marine motors ever built at the time. And there were two motors, one for each propeller shaft. The QE2's propeller shafts were 229 feet long and were each connected to five-bladed, controllable pitch propellers, which were put on new during the re-engineering process. But here's the kicker. Whether the QE2 was gliding into port or tearing across the Atlantic, those shafts spun at a consistent speed 72 revolutions per minute in port, or 144 RPM at sea, no matter what. So how did this floating giant actually change speed? How did she go from a gentle glide to full throttle sprints? The secret was controllable pitch propellers. It wasn't about changing the shaft's rotation, it was all about the angle of the propeller blades. By adjusting the pitch, the QE2's crew could precisely control her speed, a system still used on many of today's cruise ships. But here's the most mind-blowing part. How do you go in reverse? On many older ships, you would throw the engines into reverse, while some ships had reversing turbines to handle reverse speeds, but not on the QE2. Instead, they changed the pitch of the propeller blades, and boom, from over 30 knots, she could come to a dead stop in just 3 minutes and 38 seconds. The QE2 also had two bow thrusters, used to help manoeuvre the ship when it's in port. They had their own drive motors, and electricity for these was also provided by the diesel engines. These days, most modern cruise ships have three or four bow thrusters, making them far more manoeuvrable than QE2. 
Although the QE2 did have more stabilizers than modern cruise ships, four Denny Brown units, while most cruise ships today only have two. The extra pair was useful in the rough Atlantic that the QE2 was built for, and the same setup is used today on the newer Queen Mary II. In addition to the engines and motors, from 1987 the QE2 had an advanced energy recapture system to reduce costs. Heat recovery boilers were attached to each diesel exhaust pipe. Heat from the engines was used to generate steam for the kitchens, central heating and water heating, as well as steam for the commercial laundry on board and other hotel services. There were also two gas-fired boilers for use in a backup scenario. The engines also powered the huge refrigerated areas where the fresh produce was stored, as well as providing power to run seven air conditioning compressors, 186 pumps, and 178 industrial scale air ventilation fans that were used throughout the ship. This video was brought to you by me and my new book, The Evolution of the Passenger Ship. In The Evolution of the Passenger Ship, we bring years of research together to create a book that takes you on a journey from the dawn of passenger shipping right the way through to the modern cruise behemoths that we see today. The Evolution of the Passenger Ship is available at all good bookshops, and if you purchase a copy, you help us, which helps support the channel. Thanks so much, and now back to the video. The QE2's diesel power plant served the ship until 2008, and still had a lot of life left in it when the ship retired. It was kept operational as the ship was in layup until 2012, and then it was shut down for good. But this wasn't just an engine room, it was a powerhouse. It is this incredible story, the hidden world, that makes the QE2 so unforgettable. Join me next time as we delve deeper into the secrets of maritime history. And as always, a huge thank you to our channel members who help make these videos possible. Also, be sure to check out my new Substack, which has heaps of maritime history articles. And don't forget to subscribe if you want to see more maritime history videos. It helps let us know that this is the kind of content that you're after. Thanks so much for watching, and I hope you found the video interesting. And until next time, I hope to see you on board.